With me, I have Sun Life Senior, Senior Vice President and Head of Investor Relations, Lee Chalmers, La Capital Executive Vice President and Finance Lead, Melissa Gilbert, and Intact Financial Chief Financial Officer, Louis Marcotte. Welcome, everyone. Uh, so we'll get right into it. Um, I'd like to start with a broad question, but I know it's one that's on everyone's minds, and that's uh, how has your firm managed throughout the uh, early phase of the pandemic, and what do you see as um, some potentials for growth as we move past this acute phase? And let's start with uh, Lee on that one. Great. Thanks, Kevin, and thanks for having me here today. It's uh, obviously a pleasure to be here with both Louie and uh, Melissa. Uh, so actually, as you said, I am the head of investor relations, but I'm also uh, the head of capital. So. Uh, certainly an interesting to be a uh, position to be in in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, and I definitely have sort of that front row seat uh, to really see how our business has responded uh, during the pandemic. So I guess I would say, uh, first of all, we've really demonstrated the resilience of our business. You know, we've now reported two quarters of earnings since the pandemic started. And we were fortunate in that we came into this pandemic with a strong balance sheet and a very strong capital position. And that, I guess, in, in addition to our balance and diversified business mix has really helped us weather that storm. So what I'll do, maybe just looking at the diversification of our business, you know, in Q2, we did see some higher uh, life insurance mortality claims coming through, um, but that was offset by favorable benefits in our UK annuity block. So again, really having a, a very minimal impact on our, our business. Uh, from a product um, perspective, our business is really mixed between life and health as well as asset management business. So as you know, with um, low interest rate environment, um, that's obviously going to have more of a, a headwind against our insurance business. But on the uh, asset management side, our MFS pillar, we're really benefiting where investors are moving into higher yielding equity. Um, so again, that diversification is paying off for us. And then lastly, I'd say on the geographic diversification, um, obviously this is a global pandemic impacting all of our businesses, but because we're seeing some countries coming out of it sooner, particularly in Asia, for example, our Q2 results, we saw that, um, you know, our sales were really flat, um, you know, Q2 current year over prior year. And that was really a function of um, China, Hong Kong, and Vietnam coming out much sooner and really offsetting the negative headwinds we we're seeing in those countries that had those more severe lockdowns. So lots of diversification that has managed to help us remain resilient. Um, and so maybe just quickly you asked about, uh, you know, sort of opportunities that we're seeing. I would say it's it's really about digitization of our business and uh, moving to digital, being more agile. Um, you know, we started on that journey five years ago with rolling out technology to our advisors. And, um, you know, that's really helped us stand up our business quickly and then continue to be out there selling. Um, so that's a lot. That was a big question. So maybe I'll, I'll turn it over to the others to be able to jump in and, and add some comments. Uh, Melissa, would you like to follow? So hi, everyone. Very pleased to be here. Um, so as mentioned, I'm Melissa Gieber, the Executive Vice President of uh, Finance uh, for La Capital in SSQ, because that's one thing that I wanted to mention. Uh, during that pandemic crisis, we actually completed the merger of SSQ La Capital, so very proud of that. Uh, even with 97% of our staff working from home, um, the, the merger was announced on January, January 29th, and we completed the, the merger on July 1st. So in the midst of all this uh, pandemic situation, so very proud of that. Um, in terms of the, um, I would say, financial situation of the company, we managed quite well. Uh, and uh, that also allow us to uh, provide some relief to all our clients in the uh, auto insurance. Uh, so a 20% relief. And also, we also provided a 60% relief to all our clients for dental care uh, in group insurance sector. So um, so that uh, was the part we, we did for, for our customer. And um, yeah, so that's, that's about it. Louis? All right, thank you. Good morning, everyone. And uh, so our, our beginning position was one of strength as well from an operational point of view and a balance sheet uh, point of view. Primary focus at the outset of the, of the pandemic was clearly uh, safety and health of our employees, but as well making sure we had service levels adequate for the needs of our customers. And sending you know, 97, 98% of our staff 
at home and being able to maintain level service levels was a was a key priority. The second phase was a bit absorbing the uh, financial potential financial impact of the pandemic. I think uh, you know in Q1 we took up the reserves we needed uh, to cover any losses from the uh, from the crisis. And at this point in time, a few months later, we feel very confident that what we've taken is sufficient to cover uh, any uh, potential costs. So we're I think we're in a good position here. From a uh, forward-looking point of view, I think you know we came in an, in a position of strength. And really, the the goal we put for ourselves throughout the crisis was maintaining that strength, because we knew that at you know uh, further down the line in time, either we'd uh, see more shocks, and we wanted to be in a position to absorb those shocks, or alternatively, uh, should there be some opportunities for growth, we'd be in a position to capture those opportunities. So clearly, there's a view that uh, the pandemic will bring a bit of dislocation in the industry. Consolidation will take place. Will continue to take place, and uh, we want to be in a position of strength to be able to capture those opportunities, and we are. So we, you know, we feel in the, in a good position right now. All right. Well, thank you. And so obviously, the the pandemic is still uh, still not over, and there's not a great deal of certainty of when actually that might be. Uh, so, what would you say are the the biggest risk or two that's still facing your uh, that's still facing your company in the midst of this pandemic? And we'll start with Louis on that one. Sure, thank you. So as I said, I think from a, from a reserving point of view, we're at the right level. We've got what we need. And at this point in time, given the observations we see, uh, you know, the risk remains um, uh, very, very limited. Um, well, of course, what can happen to us right now is the what we call indirect losses. And those would be derived from the prolonged economic slump that, you know, we're, we're facing and that we might be facing uh, going forward. And that that's not factored in, uh, you know, wave two, and a prolonged economic uh, downturn would be uh, something that you know would would put a bit of pressure. We think we're in good position, but that's one one element we're uh, currently wa watching for. Uh, some coverages, for example, in some of our businesses in Shruti, would be uh, one that would be uh, potentially most impacted, and we're carefully monitoring what's going on on, on that front. Of course, activity on capital markets, uh, you know, the fluctuations uh are, might be important and um you know there's a bit of uncertainty going forward so uh we're prepared for that we've really uh put our balance sheet in good uh, position to capture those uh, those risks if they come around natural disasters remain uh, a risk for us you know although we're well reinsured uh you never know uh, what can happen it's been a fairly uh, quiet year so far um but they remain a potential risk and the last one i would talk to is uh, there's a lot of talk around business interruption uh, in our sector, and I would say here we feel very confident that the level of exposure we're facing uh, on that front is extremely limited. And all the uh, there's a lot of noise, but at the end, uh, our level of um, of uh, fear on that front is is quite limited. So um, those will probably cover the major risks uh, we think about on on a regular basis right now. All right, and uh, Melissa, how about for La Capital? Well, uh, obviously, we are very careful about all the risks that are, that are in front of us, especially in that pandemic uh, crisis situation. But I would say the biggest one we're definitely looking at is the uncertain economic environment right now and how it will affect all the companies and households, so all our uh, customers. Um, and obviously, so that's something we're, we're definitely looking at right now. Okay. Sure. Um, I guess what I would say is that, you know, you know, similar to what Melissa and Louis have said, it's it's really about how long and to the extent we're going to see this impact, a pandemic impacting us. So both from a market perspective and economic impact and what that means not only to our business, but our clients. So certainly market volatility. We did see the markets, um, you know, very volatile in the first period of this pandemic. We've seen those stabilize. So obviously to the extent we see more volatility, uh, it certainly will impact us from our assets under management and our fee-based business. Um, but again, that diversification, I think, helps us. And then, again, I mentioned it before, but the low for longer interest rates. Um, you know, we've been in this low interest rate environment for a while now and a declining interest rate. So as a result, we've demonstrated our products can be adjusted. Uh, we repriced in our Canadian individual business in April. 
So we will continue to look at that. But again, when you look at our business, we like to talk about it as being 20, 40, 40. So 20% of our business is really at, at risk to those lower interest rate environment, whereas 40% is our asset management business or our group business, less tied to those longer term interest rates. So, so with those, you know, our ability to adjust our pricing and our products, as well as less being less conscious concentrated in a low interest rate environment um, risks, we think we're well positioned uh, despite this headwind. Thank you. And, and you mentioned lower interest rates. Obviously, that, that's been one, one thing that's, uh, that's, that's shifted a lot in markets during this pandemic. Um, there's been a lot of other shifts in markets. I'm curious to see uh, how, have, uh, how have your firms been making changes in your investment portfolios? I guess we'd start with uh, Melissa on that one. Well, we started with a very strong position, so that uh, definitely helped. Um, we well, also, the asset liability uh, management drives our investment strategy. So obviously, we were quite conservative, so uh, the impact wasn't that that high on our uh, um, results. And um, I would have to say also, obviously, we have been very careful about all the liquidity ratio at the beginning. And uh, we made some uh, small changes uh, in the investment portfolio, but nothing, uh, I would say, significant. Um, and I would say, obviously, I think for the, um, the interest rates, definitely we are rethinking uh, on a long-term basis the way we will manage the, the portfolio, because obviously um, this will affect our, well, especially the life insurance sector uh, business. So uh, really we are thinking about how we can get the uh, return on investment that we're looking for uh, with such low interest rates. So. Uh, we yeah, so again, quite consistent. I mean, how I'd probably answer that is really looking at two aspects of our business. So first on our, on our general account assets and, and how we've adapted there, but also in terms of our, uh, our business, we call SLC management, which is about our alternative asset uh, manager. So on our general account, you know, I, I, you know, obviously nobody predicted uh, this pandemic, but it's certainly something, you know, we, we knew we were certainly long in that credit cycle. You know, I think of all the meetings I attended where we were in the ninth inning, the 10th inning, I think it was the 14th inning of the credit cycle. So everyone anticipated something was coming. And as a result, we really started to reposition our balance sheet. So, um, you know, we upped our quality on our commercial mortgage book from triple B to A. We, you know, fundamentally repositioned our real estate portfolio, moving away from, um, you know, uh, indoor malls to more outdoor malls, grocery anchored, reduced our exposure in Alberta and oil and gas. So, so we really came into this uh, pandemic positioned well, and also in a position where we had highly liquid assets that, you know, as we saw the spreads blow out, uh, like we did early on in the pandemic, we were really able to take advantage of the opportunity to buy up additional assets at, you know, high quality, but higher returns. So uh, certainly we we're in a good position as we came into that pandemic. And then the second part I wanted to highlight was just around our, our asset management at SLC and our alternative asset management business. So this is a business we started uh, six years ago, and it was about the need to look and provide our clients with alternative asset solutions. You know, the interest rate, as I said, we were operating in a declining interest rate environment. We knew there was a search for yield. So we built up this business from, you know, zero to over a hundred billion dollars today. And, um, you know, fundamentally, in that portfolio, we have uh, real estate, which was, uh, you know, we invested, we bought Bentel Kennedy. We expanded that a year ago with the acquisition of Green Oak. And then just recently this year in July, we announced the acquisition of infrared um, capital, which is about infrastructure investing. So again, um, you know, really positioning ourselves well to take advantage of, you know, the lower interest rates and, and investors looking for higher yielding uh, returns. And Louis? Sure. So uh, we came into the crisis uh, with a portfolio that had about 24% uh, equities between common equities and preferred shares. Of course, it was a bit tough during uh, Q1, but uh, we took the decision to reduce that portfolio, um, sold some of our international uh, exposures, and actually in Q2, we hedged some of the equity exposures such that today our uh, common equity went from 14 to 10% roughly. Uh, of total invested assets. So we've reduced that position. It's de-risked a bit, 
And at this point, I've not chosen to rebalance our asset mix, which is below our uh, usual target. So uh, we remain cautious because we're sort of uncertain of what's going to happen in the future quarters. As we said before, should the uh, the crisis prolong and the, the economic uh, slump continues, so we're uh, we're quite uh, careful. On um, on yields, of course, that's putting a bit of pressure on the operating earnings. Um, so we're monitoring this carefully and you know reinvesting at a uh, slow pace. Uh, we generally our portfolio turns it over over you know six or seven years, so it doesn't change abruptly. But uh, it does put a bit of pressure. But fortunately, uh, with one-year policies, we're able to reprice on the underwriting side. And uh, as we do for ROE to, to maintain our ROE target, uh, we're able to reprice you know every year and offset some of that pressure. So we feel in in you know in good shape here, even if uh, yields are declining, to maintain a, a mid-teens uh, ROE level as as we have in the past. All right. Thank you. Well, I'd like to finish with one that's maybe not, uh, you know, strictly, you know, business and, and, and financial related, but, you know, the, the pandemic has changed a lot about how uh, people behave, how uh, consumers behave, how just society functions. And, and I want to get your thoughts on what do you think might be one or two big changes that persist even, even after the pandemic uh, ha has subsided? Uh, we'll start with Louis on that one. Sure. I think uh, one change clearly is the digital adoption. We've seen a sharp rise, and you know it's clear if people have to to stay home, that's a that's a big sh shift, and uh, we're seeing uh, much higher take up rates than we have in the past. So I, th I don't think that will change. I think it's just going to accelerate. And the other one, of course, is uh, working from home. It's the I think uh, most uh, companies have have shown the ability to to get people working from home. It's working well. I'm not I'm not suggesting it's perfect. But I think it's a change that's, that's happened now and it's proven to work. So we have to adjust for that. And then finding the right way to, uh, to balance this notion of working from home, but yet keeping company culture, training of people, onboarding people, which, uh, you know, in, in a three or six months uh, space, time space, it's not maybe bad, but over long term, it might be more of a challenge. So we're trying to weigh that through, but adjusting to the fact that the, the new reality, which is a lot more work from home than, than in the past. Um, Melissa? Yeah, well, I like, totally agree with Louis. I think the, the, the two major ones are definitely uh, digitalization. I think it was already starting, uh, well, prior to the pandemic in the, all the insurance industry, but obviously I think it accelerated uh, the digitalization and also the way we uh, distribute insurance. So obviously I think if we want to reach the client that are at home, we need um, to... Um, uh, to move forward in that path. So, um, and, and the second one, obviously, it's the workforce management. Uh, I think working from home, but also it will change the way we recruit people because even though we were open to recruit, uh, I would say anywhere else, uh, I think it get it to another dimension that we can definitely work. And even if we're not locally together, I think we definitely, um, I, I would say, we definitely stepped up uh, in the way we are working with others and get closer even uh, if we're not in the same office, if we're not in the same city. So I think it will change the way we uh, work together and also how we um, attract uh, new talents as well. And Lee? Yeah, I was going to say, I think uh, I have the same notes as the other two have. So I guess <laughs> I have the exact same points, digital and digital transformation, and obviously our work from home. And I guess maybe all I would add on those two points is I really do think it's a real opportunity to build relationships, whether it's with our clients or whether it's internally with our people. You know, we, we were sort of talking uh, before we started this session about how, yes, you're not face-to-face, -face, you're not connecting in the office, but in some respects, you're getting closer to your employees and getting to know them better, their kids, their dogs, you're coming to get to know sort of their environment. So that, I think, has been a positive, and I think that will continue to change. And then I think on the client side, um, you know, clients are adopting the tools certainly out of necessity, but I think they're also going to start to learn to see it as being an opportunity to how they can connect more virtually with their advisors. Um, and, you know, just one anecdote, um, you know, in our U.S. business, the immediate uh, immediately once the pandemic hit in March, we were holding virtual sessions with our clients, employees, and our group benefit plans on one call. You know, we reached over 14,000 employees. So um, people are engaged and we're creating and providing those tools to stay connected with our clients. So I think that'll be a real upside of, of this pandemic and, and as we go forward. All right. 
Well, that is all the time we have today. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us.